Daniel. I want to finish this thing on prayer before I move to another Wednesday night subject. We're in Daniel 9. And we're looking at uh, verses 4 through 19, which, you know, uh, <clears throat> we broke Daniel like it is in your study Bible, broke it down in two sections. Uh, the prayer part of it is 1 through 19, and then the prophecy part of it is 20 through 27. That's the way we, we stayed with that division. Um, <clears throat> And we, last night we introduced the idea of Daniel's prayer uh, and dealt with the circumstances uh, behind it. And today we look at his prayer because the Father uh, recorded it entirely. I mean, it's, it's quite a long prayer from verse 14 forward. Uh, and uh, Daniel prayed... Uh, he said, I pray to the Lord my God, uh, which I hope now, when you see this phrase used in the Old Testament, um, it will have a, a, a little more meaning to your life, the Lord my God. And confessed and said, this is an intercessory prayer. This is an intercessory prayer. And I want you to, I want you to, when we go through this, watch how many times he prays on behalf of the nation and, and identifies himself collectively with their sin that has resulted in the fifth cycle of divine discipline to Babylon. Watch what he does. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed and said, Alas, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who, and that's part of this pray section uh, of prayer, who keeps, that's really important to Daniel, it, it should be to you and I, who keeps his covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity, acted wickedly and rebelled even turning aside from, your, from thy commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to thy servants, the prophets, who spoke in thy name to our kings and princes and fathers and all the people of the land. Righteousness belongs to thee, O Lord, but to us open shame, as it is this day to the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel. Those who are nearby and those who are far away in all the countries to which thou hast driven them, exiled, because of their unfaithful deeds which they have committed against thee. Open shame belongs to us, O Lord, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongs compassion and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him nor have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his teachings, which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Indeed, all Israel has transgressed thy law and turned aside, not obeying thy voice, so that the curse, that's the fifth, has been poured out on us along with the oath, which is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, for we have sinned against him. Thus he has confirmed his words, which he has spoken against us and against our rulers who ruled us to bring us on, uh, to bring on us this great calamity. That's the fifth. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done to Jerusalem. And is, as it, that's because they're the priest nation. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity, fifth cycle, has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquities and giving attention to thy truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the calamity in store 
brought it on us, for the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds which he has done, but we've not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who has brought thy people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and hath made a name for thyself as it is this day, we have sinned, we have been wicked. O Lord, in accordance with all thy righteous act, acts, let them now let now thine anger and thy wrath turn away from the city of Jerusalem and the holy mountain, for because of our sins, and the, he's, it's a reference to the where the temple is, uh, the holy mountain, for because of our sins and the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people have become a reproach. Watch this now. Thy people, thy people have become a reproach to all those around us. So now our God, listen to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplications. And for thy sake, O Lord, let thy face shine on thy desolate sanctuary. O oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and see our desolation and the city which is called by thy name. For we are not presenting our supplications before thee on account of any merit of our own, but on account of thy great compassion of grace. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action. For thine own sake, O oh my God, do not delay, because thy city and thy people are called by thy name. When you listen to that, makes this intercession, it is almost like, almost like a lawyer, isn't it? It's almost like a lawyer pleading a case before a judge. Uh, and uh, it's a magnificent... Um, it is a, a magnificent appeal of an intercessory prayer. And every once in a while, we get to see this that God records. Every once in a while, we get a chance. Though, and I'll tell you, as a rule, if you're going to look, apart from the Psalms, if you're going to look at great intercessory prayers, you're always going to find guys who are interceding on behalf of other people who are under, under the... Th really under the thumb of discipline. Um, Moses, when, you, when he does this, you're going to see this. Um, um, when he refers to Egypt here under the mighty hand of God, think how many times Moses pleaded with God over his people. I mean, it, I mean, it wore him down, right? I mean, it... As a servant of the Lord, it just warmed down. When you think of other ones like Abraham, I mean, he, that's another classic case, isn't it? Where he goes and intercedes uh, uh, with God on the righteous people of Sodom and Gomorrah when God says, I'm going to do a man, and he, he makes this great. So one of the things that's interesting when, when you look at, uh, last night I said, pay attention to when God gives an entire prayer recorded. One of the things you'll find that, what, what you'll find of interest that most of them, not all of them, but most of them are intercessory prayers. The vast majority of them are going to be intercessory prayer. And they all catch our attention anyhow. Sometimes we just don't pay attention to the fact that they're intercessory. And, uh, I mean, one day I'll come back and I'll do a whole study on intercessory and show you the characteristics of intercessory prayers. I mean, they have uh, they have a they have a structure of their own, and and he's really good at this. Um, so here's my point, <laughs> and then we'll have a word of prayer. Here's my point. There's prayer and then there's prayer. There's prayer and then there's prayer. Baby believers pray. They pray very simple prayers, but God loves them. I mean, we love to listen to little children pray their little prayers, don't we? And 
it's wonderful because they're God conscious and they're touching something that's important to both us and the child. And then it's wonderful. I listen to my teenagers. I, I usually call on some of my teenagers in my family when we're gathered around to have meals because I want to hear it. I want to hear what kind of growth they have in their life. Uh, and it brings me a different joy to hear that because now I know they're putting things together in their own life brain. And, uh, but intercessory prayer, babies don't pray it. Immature believers don't pray it. The only people that really get intercessory prayer and get it done, and, these are, and this is really big stuff, are spiritually mature people who know how to be thankful to God, know how to pray to get things done that's, that requires a great deal of doctrine to be able to cover other people's deal. Right? Intercessory prayer is pushing that thing out, out there and, and employing for other people. Right? And baby believers can't do it. Immature believers, they don't have enough savvy. They don't have enough doctrinal savvy. Both by automobile and by internet. If these people are listening to me within a 30-mile radius of our city, then I would encourage them to attend our church. If they don't have a church, then I'd encourage them to attend our church, make it a priority out of Hebrews 10.25. Make it a priority. Now, I know there's some people that, some people are still working around their way home, and, and I understand all that. But I do understand the importance of being able to be among the assembly hour if you're in the periphery. We do it for other things. We should certainly make it a priority in our life. We do it for food and we do it for medicine and hospitals and, and entertainment. It's nothing to drive 30 miles to do those things. We need to put all this stuff in priorities of our life. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what I did, and hopefully we're going to get to Daniel's 70th week next week on Tuesday. But what I did with this is I wanted to break this. I thought I would actually cover this thing in the nice chapter, 19 verses in the one prayer. And then I saw there were two parts of this prayer were really important. First of all, the circumstances be behind this intercessory prayer, I thought I needed to do that. It involved quite a, bit, quite a bit of history. I know sometimes people don't like it, but in this case, it was Daniel's circumstances of life. And that's what prayer is about when people call us and they say, I have such and such and such. It's about their circumstance of life. They give us uh, in order for us to make intercession on their behalf. And so I thought that would be important because, and, and it involved quite a bit of little history, uh, tried to not overdo it, and still at the same time show the importance of prayer in the Christian life. You know, I meet Christians all the time that don't think prayer is a necessary need in their life because God knows everything. Prayer doesn't change anything. I mean, there's so much about prayer in the Bible. How could you even get that from the book? I mean, you can't, you, you can't study anybody in the Bible that, that doesn't have a prayer life. I mean, it, so I don't know where that comes from, but it's foolishness. Uh, that's certainly foolishness. So what, and so what we're going to look at tonight, because God recorded his prayer, the entirety of his prayer, this intercessory prayer, which is not unusual in the Bible, intercessory prayer. It's not unusual to have the entire thing done for a great, a, but for us, the fact that he does it, for me, it's a red flag to really study it because of how important intercessory prayer is in the Christian life, I'm not sure we get that. I think we, in this church, I think we get the idea that prayer is important personally and collectively. I'm not sure that we understand how important intercessory prayer, and hopefully I can put that on a, a different burner on the stove tonight. You know, instead of back burner, we're going to bring it out to the front. We're, we're going to bring it to the big eye, right? Well, <laughs> boil it good tonight so hopefully we can do that tonight um, this is a, a, this is a magnificent prayer it's a magnificent prayer uh, it has all the 
elements that, you know, if you, if, if you sit down and, and say, okay, what are the things that should make a good prayer? Well, here's what makes a great intercessory prayer. You know, here's what makes a great intercessory prayer. A, a lot of bragging on God, a, a sticking to the truth of the word of God. You know, you can't blow smoke in God's face. You can blow it in my face and other people's face because we just take you at face value. But God looks at your heart. You can't blow smoke in his face because he sees your heart. No matter what your lips say, and he reads your heart. Uh, we read lips. <laughs> I mean, it's what your lips tell me uh, that I go with. I can't read your heart. Now, so, you know, you might as well, if you're going to talk to God, be honest with him because he understands it all anyhow. In fact, he reads your heart better than you read your own. Because you'll lie to yourself about most things. Right? Oh, come on now. I'm, you know, I'm not asking you to make any confession here tonight. I'm just saying that... <laughs> You know, sometimes we're our worst enemy, aren't we? But anyhow, so what, what, the, um, I got four points tonight on the intercessor pr Daniel's uh, prayer regarding the 70 years of captivity. I mean, that's just what it's all about. And the reason this prayer is important is because at least for Daniel, Daniel, when this prayer time comes up, he's been in captivity about, about 69 years. About 69 years, somewhere in that ballpark, give or take a couple of years. I mean, it's easier for me to say it's not my life, <laughs> give or take a couple of years. But he's somewhere in that ballpark. And he's been in that captivity, you know, it's, and a lot of people think that the captivity began in 605. I don't because I think the fifth, it doesn't start with, you know, you got five cycles of discipline. It don't start until the fifth comes because it doesn't fall until then. So for me, the fifth goes from 586. Uh, in this case, God put a, a, a number on it based on the on Sabbath violation. But, but anyhow, Daniel, Daniel, and so my first point is Daniel's prayers crum, comes, listen to me, comes from living the reality of the fifth. Daniel's not talking about the fifth cycle. He's living it. You know, Job is not talking about adversities in life or difficulties. He's living it, isn't he? He's living it. So, you know, this guy, he, he's got to walk his talk. Talk ain't going to do it and walk. I mean, he's got, a, he's got, and so the interesting thing about this book, about this deal, is that not only is, not only, not only is he talking, not only is he talking about the five cycles of discipline, He's lived 60, most of his life, he's lived under the thumb of an exile of the fifth cycle of discipline. And he's been, re Jeremiah has been, we talked about it last night, Jeremiah has been sending from the homeland, he's been sending in um, uh, uh, after the, for sure, for sure after Ezekiel got there, uh, off the second, which was about, what, eight years or so? Uh, let's say 605 to 597, eight years, something like that. Once, it, once Ezekiel gets in there, this stuff starts flowing really heavy. Uh, he's going to be a key, a key figure in getting the, the doctrinal lessons uh, from Maya into the, into the exiles. But we talked about that last night. Um, Daniel realizes just counting, right? Just counting. He realizes that he's close to the end of this captivity, right? If he's thinking 605, then he knows he's sitting on the button. If it's 586 and he's smart enough to know that the fifth cycle is what the, where the fall comes, he knows that he's still in the last part. He's in the last part of this thing, not the first part. He's in the last part of it. So, uh, so the five cycles of divine discipline to each nation of Israel are recorded, and I want you to know this. Again, people don't know this. I'm amazed how many in the church have no idea that this in exists in the Bible. And I, and I think to myself, I'm so fortunate 
that I had a pastor teacher that taught this stuff. Maybe I wouldn't have known if nobody taught it to me, right? But I was fortunate to have a pastor teacher that did teach this. And so I'm really fortunate. And so the fact that other people don't know that, I'm not poo-hooing them. I'm not. I'm, not, I'm just saying I am fortunate to have known this for a long time. I've studied this over many years because I had a great pastor teacher that taught it, that looked at this stuff and investigated it because it's, it's a major part of Israel's history. The five cycles of discipline came in in 722 and then 586 and then 70 AD. I mean, so I, I, I'm, I'm a fortunate person. If you've never heard, then... Look, you're fortunate that you you found a internet or if, or you found it somewhere in this city. Uh, so you want to go, you want to, if you want to read the five cycles of discipline that leads to a fifth, which is the fall of a nation, Israel, priest nation, then you want to read Leviticus 26, 14 through 39. It's in two books. It's in Leviticus 26 and in Deuteronomy 28. And you can read it. Now they're not going to lay it out in cycles. They're going to in in they're going to say here. They're not going to lay it out where it says this is cycle one and cycle two. You've got to be able to read that there's a transition going on, and and Leviticus is very easy to see it. So and then Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68. Now what you're looking for is the fifth cycle. So let's just go there for a moment. Let's just go to Leviticus. Uh, uh, let's just go to Leviticus. And, and take a look at Leviticus 26. And, he, and I'll show you the fifth. Here's the fifth cycle. It's going, to, it's going to be picked up in verse 27. I'm at uh, Leviticus 26. I've got to get 26 here. I'm in 26. And it's on your paper uh, at verse 27. Here's where the fifth starts. It's going to go from 37 to 39. And the reason I'm showing it from Leviticus is because Leviticus 26, 40 through the end of the chapter there is very, very important. So here's, here's the fifth cycle. Now remember, the fifth means there are four other ones in Leviticus 26, right? All right, here's the fifth. Yet in spite of this, you do not obey me, but act hostily, host, hostility against me. Then I will act with wrathful hostility against you. I, even I, will punish you seven times for your sin. Furthermore, you shall eat the flesh of your son. This is a fifth. These are people under the fifth. Further, uh, what? I, I'm at verse 29. Further, you shall, I'm, I'm down to, see, I just went through seven times for your sin in verse 28. Further, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters, you shall eat them. That's, a, that's how bad. And listen, they did too. This is how bad it's going to be. They're actually going to be, exercise cannibalism. Then I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and heap remains on the remains of your idols. For my soul abhors you. I will lay waste your cities as well and will make your sanctuary des desolate and I will not smell your soothing aromas. I will make the land desolate so that your enemies who settle in it shall, shall be appalled over it. You, however, I will scatter among the nations, Gentiles, and will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Then the land will enjoy a Sabbath all the days. See, I dealt with that yet last night. Of the desolation, while you are in your enemy's land, then your land will rest and enjoy its Sabbath. All the days of its desolation, it will observe the rest, which it did not observe on your Sabbaths while you were living on it. As for those of you who may be left in the land, I will also bring weaknesses into your hearts in the lands of their enemy and the sound of a, of a driven leaf will chase them. And even when no one is pursuing, they will flee as though from a sword and they will fall. Can you imagine that? 
they, it will, just the rattling of a leaf will put the awesome fear in their soul. They will therefore stumble over each other as if running from the sword, although no one is pursuing. Boy, you talk about eat up with fear. And you will have no strength to stand up before your enemies. You will perish among the nations and your enemy's land will consume you. So those of you who may be left will rot away because of their iniquity in the land of your enemies and also because of the iniquities of their forefathers, they will, they will rot away with them. How about that? That's the fifth. And listen, God honors his word as much there as he does anywhere. You understand that, don't you? That's a fifth cycle to the nation. Assyria went under it in 722, and now Judah went under it in 586. You know why? Nobody paid attention to the word of God. They didn't pay any attention to this. They threw this. Listen, when you throw God under the bus, it's because you throw the Bible first. You throw the Bible away, then you throw God, and then you, everything else goes downhill. I'm going to tell you, there's the fifth. And, and uh, you can read about the same thing in Deuteronomy, uh, verses 64 through 68. I want to read out of Leviticus because verses 40 through, what, 46 is how you recover, and that's important to Daniel. And listen, for, for us, it's hard to believe that something like this is even in the Bible, that God would, ab, would, God would do this to his people, right? That's pretty tough stuff right there. That's a discipline none of us want to be under. And, and listen, Daniel is under it. Yeah, in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. That's right. Yep, yep. But he's doing it to a whole nation of people. And listen, it, and listen. If, you li if you're left in the homeland, you're going to rot. If you go to your enemies, you're going to rot. You understand what I mean? And life is going to be tough. You stay in the land. They only leave the weak, they only leave the weak left. You understand? But, the enemy took everything that had any strength in it out, and only the strong survived. Uh, uh, other than that, the people who walked with God in a, 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 under discipline, who walked with God. Uh, Daniel was a guy who walked with God under discipline. I mean, he's a magnificent guy. I mean, anyhow. So the north kingdom that goes out to Assyria under the fifth, they go out to Assyria in 722. You know, God builds up a nation when he wants to take Israel out. Assyria, Syria, you did not want to fall in the hands of a, a Syrian soldier, and you didn't want to fall under the hands of a Babylonian soldier. You understand? Because God made them just as tough as they can get. I mean, they were, they were ruthless. Right? They were worse than the Roman soldiers? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know if they were worse, but they were in the same class because he Syria. built... Syrians really were. Yeah. Because he built them to put the fifth on these people. Their, their typical method of, of, of uh, wiping the population out once they conquered them, they had take their skin and That's steal it right. off of them. Yeah, they, they were tough. I mean, they were bad. But listen, all of them, Assyria, Babylon, and Rome, they're prepared to put, put these guys. Listen, the, the 70 AD, the people went out of these things we're talking about. It was terrible. Well, anyhow. In, the, in my NIA, and so the southern kingdom that is part of the life of captivity of Daniel, uh, my Bible, the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, in talking, Jer from talking about it, Jeremiah talks about it, of course. He's the prophet in the homeland. Uh, in the 39th chapter, the first seven verses, and my study Bible makes a great footnote. They say the siege of 586, the, the siege lasted 30 months. That's why people, and listen, what, what they did is they just surrounded the city and shut it down and just let the people, when they got through eating each other, 
Do you understand that? I don't know. I just read it to you. They're going to go through what he said. They're going to go through. They went through. The siege lasted 30 months from January the 15th, 588, to July the 18th of 586 B.C. The king of Babylon, in Jeremiah 39, verses 6 and 7, the king of Babylon, listen to this. This will show you how tough. And listen, this was, Babylon was probably a little I don't know. I, I don't want to say easier on him than the Assyrians. I don't know about that. But the king of Babylon slew the sons of King Hezekiah before, the, before his eyes and then blinded his eyes and then bound him in, feather, in, in bronze and took him to Babylon. Yeah, Z, Z, Zedekiah. Yeah, Zedekiah. Did Zedekiah. That was the king that fell. That, that was the king of the fifth cycle in 586. I mean, look what he, I mean, they, they brought him out, took all of his sons out in front of him, killed his sons, and then poked his eyes out. This is what I want you to remember. I mean, they, they, these are bad people. Yeah. That, that's hot stuff. Well, no, they put him in fet, fetters. They, like, they chained him up. Yeah, like the little. They, they chained him up with legs and arms and, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. God, God honored, God honored his promise. Listen, God promised Jeremiah when he called Jeremiah. He promised Jeremiah that he would take care of Jeremiah in Jeremiah, the first chapter, verses one through ten. It's a great story. Pre preachers preach about Jeremiah's calling, and and he had a wonderful calling, but God told him some things when he called him that he had no idea how they would roll over through his life because the end of his life would, I mean, when he got into the height of his ministry, I mean, they did terrible things. His own people did terrible things to Jeremiah. His own people. Uh, but I want to make a point with you because Jeremiah 19 is important to Jeremiah in his life, what God promised him early in his life. God honored his promise to take care of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.8, this was a, 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 a promise that God gave Jeremiah that Jeremiah needed desperately at the end of his life. He promised Jeremiah, he said, do not be afraid of them, your enemy, no matter who they are, Listen, for I am with you, declares the Lord. Now, that don't sound like a whole, a whole lot of things. I mean, you know, you're young and ambitious and starting in ministry and life is good and the nation is doing, you know. But 50 years later, I mean, your people are burying you up to your head and letting wild animals get at you and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they were your own people because he preached the truth. Because he preached the truth, they didn't want to hear it. He preached the truth to them. But listen, here is a line, and this line meant more to him. This is one line that he got. Listen to what the Lord said. Do not be afraid what, what other people do to you, for I am with you. Now, listen, you know how important that is? I'll tell you how important it is. For you and I, that same line is Hebrews 13, 5. It goes like this. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the line that he gave. That's the line he gave this man. And this is what it means to your life. Why you don't verse a scripture serious is beyond me. It's beyond me. This is a verse that will take what other people are doing to you because you hold solid to the truth of God's word. This is Hebrews. Listen, and that same line was given in Deuteronomy 31, 6 through 8 and Joshua 1, 5. The same line that we hold on to. If you have a study Bible and you go to Hebrews 13, what, 13, 5? you are going to find a reference that takes you back to Deuteronomy 31 and Joshua 1, 5. 
That's where you're going to, that's what they're going to, that's where they're going to take you. So when God says, this is why this is important. When he says to this Bible toting preacher, when he says to him, I am with you, this man his reference Bible is Joshua 1, 5 and, De and Deuteronomy 31, uh, 6 through 8. Do you understand? He, he knows what God means because he's a student of the Bible. He knows, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When he says, no matter what comes over your life, son, you stay preaching the truth. You never vary from the truth of God's word. I don't care what they do to you. I, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's what's important to you for you to know. That's important for you and I to know. This is not a casual verse. This is a big time major verse for us. I mean, the same promise he gave to this boy, he gave in Deuteronomy, he gave it to Moses and to Joshua. I don't care what comes on you. Listen. The mighty hand of God will always be there for you. The mighty hand of God. Take your eyes off your circumstances and put them on me. Put your eyes on Jesus. We sing about it, but we don't live it. Put your eyes on me. Right? That's that Hebrews 12 business. Listen, here's a verse. Everybody, everybody knows about, yea, though I walk through the valley, shall the death, but... Listen, what they miss is the major part of that story, of that Psalms 23. Even though I walk, even though, I underlined it. We all have even those. Even though. You're going to go through the even though. It's part of being, it's part of living in the devil's world. You're going to go through even those. Even though I walk, through the valley of the shadow of death. There is nothing to fear. See, that's Hebrews. That's, that's walking out Hebrews 13, 5, isn't it? That's walking it out in your life. Even though there's always that. There's always the even though that puts you in a place that would just put fear all over you. Right? The valley of the shadow of death, I mean, that's Halloween to the max. You couldn't go through a horror house worse than that. And, then, and he tells you that, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, listen to what he says, fear not. Fear, fear nothing. Why? For, for you are with me. Right? For you are with me. You ain't walk. You don't walk alone. You don't walk alone. How do you know that? Because he promised in the Old Testament and the New Testament, he's promised every believer since dirt, since he got man from dirt, he has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He never has been found guilty of that, not one time. Daniel is a good case. Here's the second thing. In Leviticus 26, you still got that open? In Leviticus 26, verses 40 through 46, God explains how to turn the cursing of the fifth into blessings. Now, D Daniel is all over that. Daniel is his prayer. That's what his prayer is all out. How do you turn the curse? Because if you read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 20, start with the curse, the curse of the five cycles. In verse 40 through 46, it's how to turn it. And Daniel is this is part of his prayer deal. If they confess their iniquities and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they have committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me. This is, listen, Daniel is throwing that back up there to him. 
and listen, you got to be spiritual mature to, to listen. He's arguing like a lawyer before the court of God about God's word. Which they have committed against me. Verse 41, I also was acting with hostility against them to bring them into the land of their enemies, or if their uncircumcised heart became humble, becomes humble, their uncircumcised heart becomes humble, so that they then make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant I've made with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham, and I will remember the land... For the land shall be abandoned by them and shall make up its Sabbaths while, it's, while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, shall be making amend for their iniquities because they rejected my ordinance. In other words, he says, I want you to get back into the word of God and, and stop doing what led you where you are. My ordinance and their soul abhorred my statues. Statues. Yet, in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemy, I will not reject them. See, that was good for Daniel. Nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them. Right. So, listen, is God, has God promised to never leave them nor forsake them? Yes. So do you suppose he's with them? as well as the people in Jerusalem? You suppose he's with these guys? If you're a believer, is he not with you in, in captivity? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he promised that. Daniel, Daniel is going to bring that up. He's going to say, listen, you're an awesome God. You're a great, awesome God. And you're faithful to your word, both on the positive and, and negative side to my life. You brought discipline collectively against us. Now I'm looking for... You brought the curse and I'm looking for you to bring the blessings. You promised us blessings. And, and he, this is where this promise of blessings comes from. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt in the sight of the, of the nations that I might be their God and their Lord. He's going to bring that up to them. When you brought us out of the land, he's going to, he's, this is where he's getting his information. He's preaching the word of God to God. He's preaching the word of God. God, that's intercessory prayer. A baby believer can't do it. An immature can't, believer can't do it. But a mature believer can do that because you don't get to maturity apart from understanding and applying the word of God in your life. That I might be their God, I am the Lord. These are the statutes and the ordinances, the law and laws, which the Lord established between himself and the sons of Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. And if you, if you, if you understand anything about Daniel's prayer, that's exactly what Daniel laid before the Lord. Listen, this is 1 John 5, 14 and 15 in the reality of function, right? I mean, you've got, to, you've got to pray according to the will of God. He hears you. You know that if he hears you, you get your answer according to the perfect plan of God. And let me tell you, people, I, I just can't tell you how important it is for, for you to understand how important it is. Let the word of God walk out of your life the things that God has promised you so great privileges of our life as spiritual mature people is to make intercessory prayer for other people. But you've got to do it according to the word of God. When you go before God and start making appeals to him, you've got to do it as a lawyer with the word of God. You've got to talk God back to God. And buddy, you've got to bend your toes. Listen, that's how you're going to get intercessory prayer done. If you think it's going to be done any other way, you're You're wrong. I mean, you could pray an intercessory prayer. That doesn't mean it's going to get anywhere. I'm talking about hitting the bullseye and get to results. I'm talking about going to the Red Sea, having, having an intercessory prayer in the Red Sea. I'm talking about. Daniel's praying that kind of a prayer. Praying that kind of a prayer. I love this line in Leviticus 20, 26, 42 that I will remember my covenant. See, we're a covenant people, aren't we? What covenant are we under? 
new covenant. Yeah, the, the covenant of grace, but it's called the new covenant, isn't it? It's the new covenant. And there's many facets to it, grace being, being one, of the, one of the large facets to it, but there are many facets to the new covenant. The new covenant. I mean, the old covenant's been fulfilled. Jesus Christ fulfilled it. So, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember my covenant. You know how, you know, listen, listen. I will remember my covenant. I will rec recover my covenant with Isaac, with Isaac, Jacob, and then Abraham. He goes backwards to forward. But listen, you know who our covenant is with? My covenant's not with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My covenant's with Jesus Christ. That's where my covenant is. My covenant's not with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I die, I'm not going to shield to Abraham's bosom. Do you understand? I'm under a new covenant. I'm going to be, in, I'm going to go stand in the presence of the Lord, man. To be answered for bodies, to be what? Present with the Lord. Hoo ah. That's so where I'm going. He, often we miss little words. Often we miss little words. And that's why I'm here. Then. Then. What's it mean by then? That's in verse 2. Well, if you're going to figure out the then, then you've got to go back to something he's earlier said. In verse 40 and 41, listen to what he said. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers in their unfaithfulness, which they have committed against me, and also in their acting with hostility against me. Listen, if they will confess to me their sin. That's verse 40. Verse 41, if their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled, that's, a, that's part two. So in part one, we got confess your sin to get back into a, a father-son relationship, father-child relationship with the Lord. The second part is, now what you're going to do with your heart your heart has gone old man thinking, gone, gone in a hostility towards me, has got to be changed. You've been arrogant. You've been a slug. You've been in host hostility against me. What is that? That's worldly thinking, isn't it? Who's, who do you suppose run in that program? Satan. Satan. You think God's going to permit that program to run long in a believer's life without Intervention? Absolutely not. He'll run it long enough to take his course so that when he jerks you up, you'll get the point. Huh? Yes. And what's he after? He's after, he's, he's after a humble heart, a grace-oriented, God-oriented heart. You understand that? Confession of sin... He said, now the second step, now you're back into relationship. Now let's correct where you went astray. Do you understand that? You know what's interesting? Write this down in your paper. Acts 7, 51 and 52. You know who said that very same thing? Stephen, didn't he? Stephen, when they were going to stone him, right? He talked about the same thing. He said, he called it uncircumcised heart and stiff-necked. And you, and you know what he's, he, what he's preaching? He's preaching the message of the prophets to Israel. Preaching the message of Ezekiel, Daniel. That's what he's doing. He's preaching to the Jew there. We don't talk to Gentiles that way. You understand? There's no history in their life of that. We, we refer to as pagan and heathens and things of that nature. <clears throat> listen, he's preaching to Israel. And listen, rightly so as a prophet to Israel, rightly so. Because they're about to go under the fifth. They're at the end. They're about to go under a fifth. <clears throat> Do we get that out of that? I don't know. People go, I don't know what all that means. Let's skip it. But <clears throat> that's a big deal. Because he's a transitional, he's a prophet to them. His ministry was his ministry was to the Jew. 
of his day under a new covenant banner. And he's using terms that they understood. And did they understand it? Yes, they understood it. And what they do? They, they did what they always did. They killed him just like the Messiah. <laughs> Except Jesus had to die on a cross because it was prophetic. He couldn't be stoned. If he could have, they'd have got him a long time ago. <clears throat> well, anyhow. It, Jeremiah, so Daniel talks this way, and he and and it, it right to Jeremiah 6.10. Jeremiah's going to talk to Israel. He's going to tell Israel the same thing. He's going to tell them the same thing. Your uncircumcised heart is going to get you in so much trouble. And what is an uncircumcised heart? That's a heart that goes away from things described by it. What's God want? He wants a humble heart. He wants a heart that is grace-oriented, that loves the Word of God, that loves to walk in the walk, no matter what, where it walks or where it walks. God will never put you to walk someplace that He doesn't walk. So, even though I walk through the valley, be afraid. Why? I'm with you. I am with you. Right? I'll get on that elevator with you. I get on that elevator with you. Going up, that's part of my life history, going up. I mean, Jesus loves going up, right? I mean, read Acts, Acts 1. Get on that elevator and go up with Jesus. You're going to go on an elevator anyhow one day, so just go ahead and get used to it. Here, here's, here's my third and final point. No, I got four. I'll never get to four, will I? <clears throat> well... I'm going to jump to four. I'm going to skip three because you can read three. It's the outline of his prayer. Okay? I went into great lengths on it for you. Well, I, I went into great lengths. I left space for you to write. But here, let me go to point four because I'm out of time. As a spiritual mature believer, Daniel is offering an intercessory prayer on behalf of the priest nation of Israel that's under the curse. And according to Jeremiah, it's a 70-year deal. And he, listen, like everybody away from home, you count days. Now, in the fourth chapter, it's verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us. Now, here's part of your sandwich, a lettuce. Right? Here's part, here's, you know, tomato and what else? Let us hold fast our confession. What's our confession? That Jesus is the high priest setting, waiting to, for, on that side, the clear intercessory prayer to go through quick. No red tape in heaven on intercessory prayer. Hold, hold, let us, right? Now I got lettuce in your mind, ain't I? Hold, hold fast our confession. You pop that prayer up there, and there's no and no red tape, right? The Holy Spirit here is sure that we're online. So when it goes from here to there, right? The Holy Spirit who lives in us, that the prayer that goes from here is correct, so it can go right back to sign off, right? I just, nobody had that deal. I mean, we got we, we live under the new covenant of intercessory prayer. Nobody had the deal we got. Now, the second thing is in verse 15. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we, yet without sin. The key word is sympathize. Our our consolation consolation is that when that get when that intercessor hits his desk he can relate every bit to it he relates every bit to it you understand he relates every bit to it and then 16 we're back to lettuce let us therefore draw near with confidence see i got three c words did you get them I have three C words. I'm not going to give them again. I gave you three C words. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. There is the power of intercessory prayer. Every one of us have that. The effectiveness of it is based on spiritual growth maturity. 
study. I'm not pushing it because I'm the teacher. I'm pushing it because it's the truth. And intercessory prayer, I mean, just think how fast we can get it done. Spirit, send, he, he cleans it all up, sends it to the death. The, the death of the high priest, where our confession goes with that, with that male, he, listen, he, he can sympathize with that intercessory in a way that nobody in heaven could. Do you understand that? I, I, apart from God, the sovereign God idea, but passes that thing right in. There it is. That, that, now watch. Here, here are closing remarks. It's not on your paper. Here are some closing remarks. The status privilege. Every believer under the new covenant, every believer has status privilege of access to God. Every believer. Understand that. You don't have to be somebody called specially. We call specially through Jesus Christ. In the church age, every believer is gifted and unique in their relationship with God through Christ. Every one of them. Every church age believer has a special status privilege of access to God. Listen to this. Rome, write this down. Romans 8, chapter 15 through 17. The Spirit, Romans 8, 15 through 17. Uh, the Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are children of God. He is our Abba Father. And that's true with every person. You don't have to prove it to God. You, you proved it when you believed in His Son. Right? That's a done deal. Then here's the second thing. That's a Romans 8. Here's the second thing. Every spiritual mature believer should have the confidence. Verse 4 says, to have the confidence, a spiritual mature believer doesn't get there without the God builds him from a baby believer to a believer, believer so that he can sit right there in intercessory prayer and hit that baby. And God is the one who moves the mountains. God is the one who, who holds the waters back for the children to go. He's the one that holds it back. Our job is to get it there and get it passed through so that it can happen. It is God that can heal the sick and do all these things. It is God. It is our prayer that gets him on that thing right then. You understand that? How important that is. So the spiritual mature believer has the confidence of the word of God and he has the boldness. He has the confidence and the boldness. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly to the throne of grace. See, he has that. And you know what God calls that guy? Listen to me. You know what he calls this guy who has this intercessory ability with God, who knows that when you go to the intercessory courtroom, you got to have you got to have your ducks in a row. You got to come with the Word of God. You've got to argue your position out of the Word of God with Him. You do understand that. Write these write these verses down. I'm going to give you a guy, Abraham. Abraham is used an example. And I'm going to tell you what he You're called when you can do that. You're, listen, called a friend of the court. Friend of the court. In James 2.23, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7. In Isaiah 41.8, they talk about Abraham. And he's called the friend of God. And you know why? He's going to tell you. If you read those verses, tell you why he's called the friend of God is because he has this ability to go to intercessory prayer and get it done. Uh, 41, 8. Listen, here's the third thing that I got. I got to go home. Okay? I know you do too. What you got to have through the word of God is confidence in the character of God. That God is compassionate, he's long-suffering, he's patient, he's merciful. He's a God of just. 
God will act upon his word quicker than you're, you can imagine. He'll, he'll, do, he'll do it quicker than your heart can beat. You've got to come before him in faith looking for grace to do it. You can't come in there and whine. And you've got to come with the word of God. You've got to come by faith. You've got to come confident and bold with the word of God. When you read, you read these guys' prayers, when they go to intercessory prayer, boy, do they lay it out. you got to come. you got to be a friend of the court. <clears throat> and that's important. My final thought is, and this is kind of important as an intercessor prayer, positive answers still may be sad. Listen to me now. Positive answers to your intercessory prayer, positive answers may still be sad. They may have what we would call sad results based on unrealistic expectations. And let me give you an example. So don't do that. You may get a positive answer that may have sad results. For example, one of, one of Abraham's great intercessory prayers was over Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot. You, you know that one. And he prays his prayer and God, well, boom, boom, right? City's on fire and he brings a They lost everything of worldly right? They lost everything of worldly value, everything that living in Sodom, a coastline, you know, living on the beach type thing. In other words, whatever your expectation of great living was, they had it. They lost all. And he lost what? Lost his wife. Lost his wife. She, right? Because she looked back. She was told not to look back. Don't listen. It's not where you're coming from that's important, honey. It's where you're going. No, no river mirrors, mirrors went out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so while the story, while the positive, the, he got a positive answer for his intercessory prayer. It could have had sad results based on unrealistic expectations if you thought, well, gosh, they've lost everything. I then the whole thing. You understand? Unless you understand how truthful the word of God is, right? So sometimes people will bring a prayer up there, give results, and get into a sad experience. See, Job's friends did all that, didn't they? That's all right. And just tore them up. Tore him up. Nah, leave it, leave it, William. It's all right. Let's have a word of prayer. I can pick that up. It dropped. I'll pick it up. But thank you for the thought. I can still get down that far. <laughs> I can still do that. There may be a day I'll need you, though, William. There may be a day I need you. Right now, I can get it, though. Father, we're so thankful for this time together and this, this concept of intercessory prayer. We, we're, as a church, we are so eager to be engaged in it and see the mighty hand in, in great ways. And, and we do. We do see that, Father. And we're so thankful for it. I just pray that more people would join the ranks of intercessory prayer, but they'll never get there. They'll never get there where they want to be until they become good students of the Word of God where they began to, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the word of God, inhale, God breathe, inhale and exhale into their personal life and see the dynamics of it working in their life so they can walk it out in the life of other people. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.